Welcome, welcome everybody, welcome and congratulations. It's the first year of Unowell. It was a year under pandemic conditions, so I was working and studying mostly from home, but still it has shaped and shifted our ideas of well-being and how we want to create it, how to advance and foster well-being now and in the future. What opportunities do we see? What can we look forward to? And during this event called Festi Well, we are celebrating these new ideas and insights in all kinds of forms, from all kinds of perspectives brought to you by all participating universities. This session you are watching right now is organized by Leiden University and the University of Florence and we are broadcasting fr from Plintz, it's the associate partner of the university. It's a startup facility and home to talented students here in Leiden. My name is Oscar Kokke and I have the honor to introduce to you a few very inspiring guests and they will talk about their research, how they look back on the first year of Unowell and what plans do they have for the near future. I would like to start with the chair of the steering group Individual and Social Wellbeing, Joachim Koops. Good to have you here, Joachim Koops. Uh, we're going to talk about individual and social well-being, your research arena. But first, uh, let's start by looking back. Uh, it's the first year of Unowell. And I remember meeting you a year ago. You were online, right? It was yeah. online, yeah. It's the first time I see you in person. But back then, you were as enthusiastic as could be, really looking forward to start with this great project. Well, we are one year further. How, how do you feel about it? How do you look back? Uh, right, um, just as enthusiastic as before, I think. Still? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Uniwell is going well in that sense, but of course there were lots of challenges uh, related to what we just uh, alluded to, so the fact that we now for the first time meet in person before it was entirely online, and that was exactly the same thing, of course, for all activities um, we had planned and we were doing. And that also meant all meetings, that meant uh, coordination, that meant also implementation, a lot of exciting seed mm. run projects that simply had to be done uh, online via Zoom or via Teams. Yeah, it, it was uh, a strange time to start something new that is essentially about social awareness. Yeah, it, I mean, on the one hand, so I think there were two effects of, of the pandemic for, for the project. Um, it was written before the pandemic really hit, uh, before you know we could even have known about it. Uh, so of course, just when we started, we had this situation and it focused even more the importance of this entire endeavor, right? Uh, before it was clear that well-being is an important aspect, but then of course seeing a global effect of a pandemic and how health essentially affects every single um, element of society and education, um, well, that really galvanized and motivated us even more to work on it. And But on the other side, yeah, it, these kind of projects uh, we only work with um, interaction with meeting people with of course the entire idea was mobility it was mm -hmm. about getting to know our partners in the different countries and also i wouldn't have minded you know uh, going to italy to our uh, friends uh, in, in florence uh, in <laughs> Poor person you. Poor and you. to have uh, you know a bit of food and a taste yeah, of that but, but, but how, how did you manage well you know um that still can be done we still have two thirds to go of the project so i'm really looking forward to physical meetings um but i must say because we were all very enthusiastic and still are also just doing it online um, still provided so many opportunities and so many things have happened. What, what has uh, happened? Well, if you just look at, you know, I can throw numbers now at you and um, I did Please do. do my homework a little bit. So, you know, we apparently had um, 83 different meetings of working groups of from senior leaders to students to different working groups and, and steering committee meetings um, all online so far. Uh, more than 300 people were involved across the board. There were, of course, uh, seed grant projects. So mm -hmm. this is now the third call coming out with two calls already. Uh, I think more than 100 applications for these and 16 projects launched already. And these are projects that have to involve ideally all seven universities. So you can imagine uh, the amount of activities across the University Alliance, ranging from multiculturalism and well-being mm -hmm. to health to uh, human rights issues, well-being for students and so on. So a lot of things. Uh, happened, uh, uh, also a huge symposia, for example, on best practices of well-being for students um, and so on and so forth. Um, and there are more than 102 associate partners, so all the 
city councils of the seven uh, partners are involved. There was a big mayor meeting just uh, recently as well, really reinforcing the importance of yeah. this civic university idea, so that the universities should really interact with the cities there. Yeah. So plenty of things happened, um, and uh, all of that in, with uh, zero carbon. <laughs> for sense. Are you proud? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, but you could also see that this entire project of well-being will also have an influence on sometimes on our own well-being in terms of additional pressures, right? We're all busy with our um, research and teaching, and so this is very often on top. Yeah. Uh, and so it's really driven by a lot of enthusiasm um, and, and kind of volunteering. So almost. not only are you proud, you're also tired. I think we're all <laughs> a bit tired, um, it has to be said. Um, but yeah. But I think uh, the, the positives outweigh the negatives on this. Sure. So th this is the, the context about Uniwell. But to, to dive more specific into your own research agenda, what, what did you do? Yeah, I think the exciting thing about, about it is really the multidisciplinary approach. So it's really on the one set, when, when you think about well-being, obviously the first thing that comes to your mind is health. And there's a huge health component. But there's also a component of trying to really have combine the social sciences with the medical sciences, but also look at the health of society, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how, how far are we in terms of the well-being of democracy? If we think about um, fundamental human rights, but also the social fabric of society um, before and after the pandemic. So a lot of uh, focus is, for example, now placed on the widening gap of uh, social in inequality and wealth. Um, how do we deal amongst our seven partners in Europe with these challenges, but also how do we, for example, cooperate at the global level? So mm -hmm. a lot of aspects is in our research arena is focused on individual and societal or social well-being. So yes, of course, on how do uh, well-being and human rights issues play out for you and me, but also for the local level, local communities, the national level in Europe, and then also in global partnerships. So um, it is a really broad term of well-being and many dimensions, and lawyers work on it uh, as much as uh, peace and security researchers, uh, yeah, people from the medical profession, um, humanities. So, it really brings a lot of uh, fantastic people together uh, on working, yeah, on a agenda of well-being really broadly defined. Yeah. And how does this work out for the university? What will students see? Uh, what will happen in the next months, next year? Yeah, I think students are, have already been very, very busy in, in setting up a variety of projects, symposia, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. working on new curricula, uh, mobility projects. So I think now that we slowly see that we can travel again, I think now is also the phase in February to, to May to, to implement all these things that we have been planning for students in really starting with the exchange. I mean, the main idea behind UniWell is, is we, we often think about it, of course, as research, but it's really education and it's combining research and societal impact all of that within the educational framework. Um, so again, now I think apart from virtual mobility, it's about physical mobility. And mm -hmm. um, we're also planning now in the planning phase of the first joint MA program. This is on health, well-being, and peace. So yeah. you really combine these kind of aspects of individual health uh, to what is what do we, what's the well-being of society in the sense of, of a peaceful society. Mm -hmm. Is that um, a really new approach? This is completely new. You really, um, you have, for example, masters on, on, on uh, global public health, which looks at the interface of polit politics and medicine. Um, but now with this program, you really combine peace studies with the medical sciences and, um, and uh, uh, yeah, broader issues of well-being, also relating, for example, to this concept of the economy of well-being. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you want students to get involved. They can uh, come up with own ideas. Uh, there is this, this thing called seed funding. Uh, is it like an open call for students? What, what can you yeah, tell Yeah, absolutely. About it? absolutely. So I think the seed funding idea works really well because you want to create some kind of financial incentives that people really get together and think about a specific project and how they want to implement a variety of things. It can be anything. It can really be from a little research project to teaching innovations to a joint international uh, societal impact project working with NGOs, working with hospitals or, or mm -hmm. the city uh, together. So um, like the two times before, I really suggest people have a look at the website as well where you see also the previous projects. You can apply um, with partners from the seven partner universities. If you have a great idea about either how you know, 
innovative teaching with a link to well-being can be advanced or how to increase universities' impact on societal issues, then uh, yeah, this is something we need to, to do. And there were a lot of uh, student-initiated project funded in the last two rounds, so it's not just uh, professors and, and, and researchers that, that, that get these kind of uh, startup funding that will then help students to develop their own projects. Yeah. We, we do have a little movie from two uh, of the, those, those uh, students, they're both from Leiden University, uh, Kendra and Gilberta. They applied for the first ever uh, seed funding call, it was in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and their idea was to host a symposium, and you, you mentioned it. Yeah, it's symposium about on best practices of well-being, and uh, that already took place. Yeah. And so it was really about um, because on the one hand, we have this external mission with UniWell, which is how do we increase well-being in general in society. But of course, we also have to uh, essentially uh, um, practice what we preach. So how do we increase also well-being for university staff, members, and for students? Uh, and again, given the, co the COVID context, this has become even more pressing, but even also more difficult. Um, you were at the symposium yourself? I could not make it. No, I was not there, unfortunately. No. Oh, <laughs> poor you. Indeed. But... We do have this movie uh, made by uh, Kendra and Gilberto, and I. Uh, ah, well, let's let's watch it. Great. Boo! Hello, hello, beautiful people. I'm glad to see you all. I'm actually in beautiful Zurich today for my own mental well-being. I decided to take a small little trip outside of the city, but we're doing well. And as you can see, and here the bells are ringing. And just like that, the bells of our hearts are also ringing because today is festival. And it's so important that we continue to bring mental health and well-being in everything that we do. The last time we were here um, together, we spoke a lot about this alignment, right? That, that it's not just important that we have mental health and well-being as a focus in our research, but that we also apply it in everything that we do in our lessons, but also on our individual lives, and that we are not separate beings, we are one whole being. And yeah, I hope that this conference um, and the conversations that you will be having today and tomorrow, that they stay with you and that they help you to continue to apply the practices, not just for students, not just for the research itself, but for the focal point of well-being in all that you do. And now I'm going to hand it over to Kendra, who I think is still in The Hague, and she's going to tell you what she learned and how she can continue and, how, and, and the lessons that you'll continue to apply um, within this conference. Thank you so much. Here you go, Kendra. Hi, Gilberto. Hi, everyone. Yes, I am in the hey, Gilberto. It is nice to see you all again. And as you're saying, Gilberto, the focal point of well-being is yourself. And something that I learned during this journey, also with the symposium, is that it's okay to still be learning. Take that time to really get to know how to improve the well-being within yourself, but also for your community. And I think that that's an important focus that I that I have come to acknowledge and I'm very grateful that Uniwell is promoting this and promoting what's really important such as having an inclusive well-being agenda and collaborating with students because it's only when you put the students at the top that we really get to hear from each other. So I encourage you to speak up and enjoy the rest of the two days here at Festival. See you soon. Thank you so much uh, Kendra and Gilberto. Uh, Joachim, how do you React to this. Yeah, it's great to also see the enthusiasm, I think, uh, in those two students and probably quite representative for, uh, for a lot of students. And yes, of course, uh, both of them are completely right that uh, the key priority and the, and the kind of end objective of it all is really also uh, students and, and student well-being. Yeah. Um, and I think well, we should also not forget, I mean, of course, undergraduates and graduates, but we also see a lot of stress and increased vulnerabilities amongst PhD. Students, uh, just, just today I saw a study also in the UK that uh, four out of 10 PhD students are at the risk of suicide. Um, similar studies have been done also in the Netherlands uh, two years ago. It's not as bad in terms of uh, suicidal uh, thoughts, but uh, I think the pressure also on, on young researchers, PhD students, and the qu question of mental health, health well-being is, is really increasing. So yeah. um, I think, yeah. Uh, across the student population from BAMA, PhD, um, it's very, very important and it's good to see so much enthusiasm. Yeah, and good to learn that they, um, they are so open-minded and honest about their feelings. It's, yeah. it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to uh, realize 
it's okay to to still be learning. Yeah, under, absolutely, so. absolutely. Yeah. And I think again, I think the pandemic also helped here. I think and that's being confronted so clearly with the situation, yeah. and that you really, you know, everyone is more or less in the same boat, and you really have to be much more explicit and open about. Yeah. In what way learning. are you still learning? Are you still learning? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, I think we mentioned it last year as well. I think uh, when I reflect about my own uh, well-being and taking a break and. Uh, Work-life balance. Uh, this is incredibly difficult, and it's it's always you know uh, two steps forward and another step, and sometimes even two steps back again. And you start at zero, and you again overwork, and uh, um, getting that balance right is yeah. is, is, is tough. Um, and getting the balance right between really wanting to do a lot on societal well-being in terms of research and wanting to do a lot on ed- educational impacts, but also thinking about yourself. Um, yeah, not not easy, I guess. No. Well, I. I I would say take a little rest, but you won't, <laughs> because what what are your plans for the future? Yeah, so it's really now the kind of hot phase with with Research Arena Two, which I'm uh, leading for the Uniwell, and that really focuses now on Sustainable Development Goals 16, and it really ranges from research and education on um, yeah the rule of law, uh, corruption issues, uh, human trafficking, um, also post conflict. Uh, resolution. We're looking at a lot also in partnerships with Africa um, and global dimensions. So a lot both in The Hague and in Leiden and in the European uh, partners, but also on the global level. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting, challenging, but um, it's really great to be part of. You're looking forward to it. Sure, for sure. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. It was uh, great having you in the show. Uh, Thanks thank for you. having me. Thanks a lot. Joachim Koops. Thank you. Thank you. And as I mentioned before, this session is a collaboration between the Leiden University and the University of Florence. And I would love to talk to the people from the University of Florence as well. So I would like to invite Francesco Ferrini. Francesco. Hello, hello everyone. You are the lead and chair of the steering group uh, Environment and Urbanity and Wellbeing. We're about to talk about a forest in your campus, how urban green can improve student health and well-being. But first of all, how are you? How is life in Florence? Life is good. It's much better than it was last year. And uh, right after we started the Uniwell University Consortium, because I was in Cologne, in Col, right before the the, the, the pandemic issues and then now I think it's getting better. The weather is sunny, uh, the temperature is fine, it's about 20 degrees, so we enjoy the fall in Florence. <laughs> well, th- that's important to know. Um, are you in a green area? Because that's the topic we're about to talk about. So where, where are you right now? I'm in the university campus outside of, of the city. Uh, it's quite green, it's not really green because there are a lot of buildings, but they are all surrounded by uh, lawns and some trees. And we can see the mountains just close to Florence. But I also can see the airport, unfortunately, from my office. So it's quite close to the airport, even though we are in the open, in the open field. <laughs> but I can see some green anyway. Why is urban green that important? Uh, it's, it's very important because uh, using the, the green to improve air quality, it means also to improve our health. There is a tight connection between the environmental health and the human health. Uh, it's called the One Health concept because now we are, you know, uh, we have a lot of evidences, uh, scientific evidences that uh, Human, human health, uh, environmental health, and animal health, even the microbiology, m- microbiological health are tightly connected. And we cannot do anything without having the nature uh, among us and outside of us. So there are some uh, books and a lot of uh, scientific uh, articles we, that relate, relate the, uh, the, the greening, the urban greening, with the human health and especially the the, uh, the, the students' health, because you know uh, the students spend too much time inside buildings and they can be uh, affected by the so-called sick building syndrome. It's the sick, sick building sick syndrome. Building is, syndrome. What, what's, yeah, what's sick building syndrome? What? Sick building syndrome. The acronym is SPS. It describes a situation in which people who spend most of their time inside buildings experience acute health and comfort effects, but no specific illness or cause can be identified. 
usually the they complaints, uh, complaints may be localized in a particular room or, or zone or maybe widespread uh, throughout the building. And the term must not, must not be confused uh, with the term building related illnesses. Because in that case, uh, we refer to symptoms which are diagnosable, uh, are identified and can be attributed directly to airborne building contaminants. In this case, the sick building syndrome, syndrome is not related to airborne building contaminants. It's just a, a stressful situation uh, due to the, the time that we spend usually uh, inside buildings. And uh, the younger generation, they're called the indoor generation because they spend up to 22 hours inside buildings. Uh, and that can, that can be very dangerous. And, uh, you know, the, the building uh, occupants complain of symptoms which are associated with acute discomfort, for example, headache, uh, eye or uh, nose or throat irritation. They have a dry uh, cough, dry or itchy skin. They can feel dizziness uh, or nausea and they have difficulties in concentrating and they feel much more fatigued than being outside and they sometimes lose their sensitivity, sensitivity to others. And the cause of the symptoms is, is not uh, really uh, known and most of the uh, complainants report, uh, they report relief soon after they, they leave the building. So it means that it's something that is connected to being inside the building because it's not, it's not an, illness, it's an illness that you can uh, get out uh, taking you know, pills or medicine or whatever. So the solution yeah, is... Outside. The solution is more gr urban green. That yeah, helps. more time outside, more urban green. Yes, right. So we plant a forest in the campus. Yeah, we need a forest in the campus. We need like, a forest. Yeah. Okay. Like, like, you know, like the campus uh, all over the world, like in the United States or in Canada, also in some part of Europe. But it won't fit everywhere. No, actually, you know, uh, especially if you live in a city like Florence, where the space is not uh, so much, and also most of the buildings are uh, dating back to the middle, the middle age or the Renaissance age. So it's hard to have the old buildings uh, and the, the green areas around. Uh, when I was the dean of the school, I had been the dean for six years until 2000, December 2020, my office was just outside of the main park in Florence. So from my window, I could see the biggest park and, uh, in Florence. My office was the office of the Grand Duke of Tuscany. So my office was full of frescoes, a lot of nice, you know, nice furniture. And I could, at the same time, I could see the park outside of my office. So it was a, an easy, an easy view, any, a, sorry, a nice view to see every single day. When I was a little bit stressed, I just looked out of the window and I, I felt much better immediately. So the dean was very healthy, but uh, were the students? Um, I don't know, maybe, yes, I was, I was healthy at the time. I'm still healthy, I thought. <laughs> it is said that uh, urban green even can be helpful for people diagnosed with uh, ADHD. Oh, yeah, right, yes, yeah, attention deficit disorder. Uh, it's another problem, especially for the younger uh, generation. You know, uh, as I as I say, they are called the indoor uh, generation. The, the kids that have now in between eight and uh, sixteen, maybe eighteen uh, years, and they are just you know uh, close to become university students. And they can suffer this kind of, of disease, so they they feel uh, very difficult to concentrate, to listen to the people and to, uh, to learn things because of that. So it's important to know that it's not uh, someone's fault uh, if they don't learn enough or if they don't get enough information, but it's, it's a problem that is due to the, the surrounding environment. Uh, their house, uh, the university buildings, maybe the school, maybe the city itself can be sometimes uh, stressful. No, uh, you know, when we are talking about cities, uh, 
the 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 words that uh, come to our minds it's chaotic uh, noises uh, pollution uh, frantic and all these kind of words maybe we should have cities uh, that uh, can be described like nice beautiful relaxing uh, calm and so on uh, I, I always um, made a comparison between, I don't know if you have uh, seen in, uh, the movie with uh, Michael Douglas, uh, I, don't, I don't recall the name in, in English now, but uh, he Try just got Italian. crazy. I don't... <laughs> what, what's the title in Italian? Uh, in Italian it's a, a, a day of, a day of uh, ordinary craziness, but it's... Uh, F falling uh, down. Falling down, right, falling down, right, you're correct. Falling down and uh, because, you know, he's so stressed by the family, by the city and so on, and, it, I, and he falls down. Uh, and I, I always compare with the, with the movie A Room with a View, you know, that was filmed in Florence. It dates back to the, the early 900, 1900, but it's something that is very relaxing, the countryside, the green outside of the city, and the, you know the, the Los Angeles city, which is very chaotic, a lot of pollution, and so on. So I I always teach my students look at the difference between these two mm -hmm. uh, situation, and uh, it's it's a way to uh, engage student. Uh, I always show some something in my slides during the lesson, something which is uh, has which has nothing to do with the with the with what with what I was talking uh, I was uh, I'm talking in that moment just to keep the attention of the students on the lens. And sometimes I show also pictures from movies, from songs, from musicians and so on. So I think it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a way to keep the students and, you know, uh, on the lesson. The, the idea of uh, Univell is also to learn from other universities, from other cities. And I think th these lessons you told us, they can be learned from Florence. Is there something you can learn from the other universities? I, I can learn a lot of things. In this, in the last two years, almost two years, I, I miss a lot uh, not travel to meet other people, to meet other students all over the world, because you can, uh, I always, I always came back richer when I spent time outside of, of, uh, of my university, visiting other universities, uh, meeting our uh, other uh, colleagues, meeting students from all over the world, because you can always learn uh, learn something. You you don't have to stop learning uh, in in your entire life, uh, because it's it's the nicest thing that you can do. Learning is much better than teaching for me. Um. The University of Florence, uh, in collaboration with the uh, University of Birmingham, is organizing the Mini Cup 26 event. Yes, yes. That's, uh, that will start uh, later today. Uh, what is it about? I know, I think that people uh, know about the uh, COP26 uh, and what are the, uh, the, the target to achieve uh, uh, that were supposed to be achieved at COP. 26 to secure global net zero uh, by mid-century uh, and keep 1.5 degrees uh, within uh, reach. Uh, you know that country have been asked to uh, come forward with the uh, very ambitious 2030 2030 emission reduction target that align with reaching net zero by the mid of the century. And I think that Mini COP 26 can. Uh, stimulate students also to uh, know uh, that a single person uh, just um, change a little bit his behavior or her behavior can do a lot because if every one of us and we are you know 400 millions maybe in Europe each, if every one of each one of us uh, does something together we can do uh, a lot so we have to do something to accelerate the phase out of coal uh, to curtail deforestation, which is something that I'm very interested in, to speed up to the switch uh, to electric vehicles and to encourage investment in renewables uh, source. 
And then we have two adapt to protect adapt to protect communities and natural habitats, as I said before, because the the, the, the health of the environment is also our health. So so the, the climate is already changing, you know, and it will continue to change even as uh, we reduce emission with devastating effects like uh, we, we, we saw in Germany last summer. And I think it's this mini COP, uh, we need to work together to enable and encourage uh, students from different countries which are affected to climate change to protect or to know how to protect the and to restore the ecosystem, uh, how to uh, uh, build defenses, uh, how to use warning system and resilient infrastructure and agriculture to avoid loss of homes, uh, livelih livelihoods, and even lives as it happened in, in Germany. And then we have a thing to mobilize finance because also fin the, the, the economic uh, part is very important. So uh, to deliver uh, our goals, uh, we, we have to uh, some way mobilize a lot of money as we have done for fighting the, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And think that, that uh, working together, uh, we can only rise to the challenge of the climate crisis by working together. Uh, so at MINICOP 26, I think that we must in some way finalize uh, some uh, targets, some objectives in the future. Uh, we have to, to know the, how to accelerate action to tackle the climate crisis through collaboration between our universities, and because we have seven universities from different parts of Europe, but all these parts are very strongly affected by climate change. So what I expect from the mini-COP is to exchange information among teachers and, and students, because, you know, uh, our problem is your pro are your problems are you know uh, UK problem are Semmelweis problems and we are on the same boat we used to say in Italy and we had to uh, roam together to get to the uh, to the island. We're on the same boat. It's important to work together. It's important to talk to each other and it was an right. honor to talk to you. Thank you so much, Francesco Ferrini, the lead and chair of the steering group Environment and Urbanity and Wellbeing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. My next guests are from the Department of Population Health. Uh, Matthijs Numans, uh, academic lead and chair of the steering group Population Health, and Marise Wiewel, manager Arena Population Health. Welcome both. Thank you. Um, Population health, has well-being always been a focus point in your research? More or less, yes. Um, but well-being is wider than population health. It's more than the absence of disease or, yeah. What is it? Population health is, I think, uh, widely uh, accepted that it is uh, uh, people feeling well in their uh, in their context and um, developing healthy, something like that. Yeah. And what have you been do in, uh, doing last year, the first year of UNOL? What have you been up to? Yeah, well, actually it started a bit earlier. We had a Skype meetings with 30 people and they're all very different uh, backgrounds. Uh, there were uh, because you were there from the start. Yeah, yeah there were people, uh, well, medical specialists and um, primary care physicians like me, and there were uh, 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 behavioral uh, scientists and uh, biomedical engineers and pathologists, all kinds of people uh, talking about well-being, which is... Busy meetings. Busy meetings, yeah. Not easy to, to bring these people together uh, in one direction, but finally we succeeded in finding a way, and we called it Population Health Life Course, which is... Uh, meant to um, uh, keep every, everyone aboard mm. and um, have an interdisciplinary interaction on uh, how to keep people healthy. Yeah, that was the starting point. Yeah. How, how is it going? Yeah. Well, it's going rather well. <laughs> um, we developed a, a concept master program the past year. Um, 
um, which adds to existing master programs in, in the in the cities that are cooperating in this project. Uh, and indeed, I think we found in every city specialist areas where where people know more than the others, mm -hmm. so that we can bring when we bring these people together, we we have a program which is. Um, Worthwhile, very worthwhile for for students and uh, PhD students to uh, to follow and uh, meet each other. And the next thing, the other thing we did is develop. Maybe Maris can tell a bit about that. Uh, we develop a concept on a, on a living lab. I want to know everything about <laughs> it. What is a living lab? <laughs> a living lab is an innovation ecosystem and is based on co-creation mm -hmm. uh, in which different stakeholders work together um, from academia but also from the government, from private institutions and that all in close collaboration with citizens. So in a population health living lab you can imagine that the municipality works together with uh, healthcare institutions but maybe also the health insurance, social care institutions mm -hmm. and then all together with citizens to develop um, products, but also maybe new ways of working. Mm -hmm. um, and where do you do this? Is there, do you have an example? Well, you do it all in the region. So it's a regional living lab. Mm -hmm. uh, in The Hague, we have a population health living lab in which we conduct research and we also projects together with students. But is it like in a hospital or is it uh, in the city as a whole? Uh, you, you have to see it as um, um, it's like um, it can be everywhere. It's, it's all we have a campus in The Hague, where, which is sort of the basis, but we work together in different projects, so it can be with different stakeholders. So there's not one specific spot where you do it, but you do it in the region. Yeah. And, and what's the, uh, how is it different from just doing a pilot? Uh, because, well, uh, just bring it in practice and see what happens. Uh, what's the scientific part of it? Well, what's so interesting <laughs> is that you have the stakeholders there from the start. So. Um, you can come up with a very good idea, but if, you, if that's not going to work in practice, then it takes a lot of effort, time um, to really implement that. And mm -hmm. if you have, wait, know from the start that it doesn't work for a patient, for example, or it doesn't work for a healthcare professional, then it's very nice to know that in the beginning. Yeah. It also works the other way around. When a, a citizen has an idea, then that's an ecosystem to make those ideas come really, you know, um, be really developed in a in a good co-creational um, way. So that's the living lab. Uh, what are the other parts you're, uh, you're thinking about and maybe implementing? Well, the other part is obviously the, the, the educational part, which is uh, the of master course. program. <laughs> and and uh, within this, this living lab construction, we try to develop these, these living labs in all cities that we, that we cooperate with. And they might have they might all have other um, uh, concentration points, uh, so other uh, target populations or other uh, goals f to, to mm -hmm. develop uh, health. And in this collaboration, when you, you look to the other universities, the other cities, what do you learn? Is there something, an eye-opener, something new to you? Yes, well, I, I think in the discussions we had, um, it was good to see that there are various, um, uh, in each city has its own strong sites, like um, Birmingham, has, Birmingham has a very strong um, population health uh, methodologi methodological uh, uh, program. And Florence has, has a very high risk um, in a city population uh, studying um, uh, perinatal risks uh, around uh, uh, birth and around young women mm -hmm. getting children. And well, there are in, in, in Cologne, they have a, a, a elderly program or a old, old, age, old age people program, which is a bit further than ours. So we can cooperate on that. And there's a, in Lund, uh, Linnaeus University has a strong e-health and artificial intelligence program from which we can learn a lot. Yeah. And so they can learn from other things from us, like the development of this living lab construction, yeah, exactly. which, is, which is our model, I think. So yeah. you're learning a lot um, when it comes to new perspectives, yeah. uh, new ways of teaching. 
Are you learning something about your personal well-being? Um, so far, uh, well, I recently joined the, the health arena. And what I've learned so far is that it's really nice working together with people from different university. And what I've learned about my own well-being, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's very important to always take your time to do things. So um, you really have to um, think about yourself when you're doing new things. So for me, it was all quite new in this new um, process, but I think I've managed quite well together with Matthijs to develop uh, a really beautiful um, roadmap for the Living Lab. Mm. So I think that's, yeah. yeah. I think for ourselves, well, it's always an eye opener to see uh, health and well-being in other cultures, uh, how people think about it and how it, uh, it can be influenced, mm -hmm. which is uh, obviously always comes back to yourself. Yeah. So tell me about it. You know, uh, <laughs> in what way I, does it I'm come back to I'm yourself? A, uh, on one day per week, only working as a general practitioner in a, in a, in a city with a with an intercultural and a multicultural problem. So this is recognizable, the problems are recognizable from other cities. And uh, I always learn from that. Yeah. Yeah. And do you take rest sometimes? Uh, could be better, yeah. <laughs> could be better. And how about the pressure <laughs> in, uh, in university? About it's, it's a new job, you're here from uh, since September. You're new to it. Is, 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 does it come with pressure? I felt the pressure to deliver um, um, a position paper and a roadmap on November 1st. Um, but I knew from the start that I worked with a group of people that are all very um, human focused and we're all working on health and well-being. So I think that's a very nice environment to, to work in. That yeah. sounds very good. And for, for the near future, what are you looking forward to? Um, well, we look forward to, to really start preparing the setup of the living labs in the different university cities. Um, we have now a first concept of the master's program and we have the aim to develop um, a summer school for next summer. That's the first short term program that we're going to work on. Uh, that's still um, yeah, work in process, progress. So um, that's all we're going to do. Yeah, well, and one of the, the nice things post COVID pandem pandemia is that we want to meet people. Uh, yeah, we, finally, we, look them in the eyes. Yeah, look them in the eyes and um, outside the screens that we're all looking at for one and a half or two years now. So you booked a ticket already? No, not yet, no. no. What's the first city you want no, to visit? I think it will be the beginning of next year that we, that we can, we can well, what What university would you like to visit mm. first? <laughs> Spring, Florence, isn't it? <laughs> Florence. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> same thing. Mine was Florence too, actually. Okay, well, you can travel together <laughs> and, and work together uh, when you're on the train or no. by plane. No. Okay. And there are other cities that are very interesting too. Yes, yeah. of course, it's very diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much from the Department of Popula Population Health, Matthijs Numans and Marise Wiebel. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Now we go to my last guest, it's uh, Giovanna Del Gobbo. She's uh, academic lead and chair of the steering group Teacher Education. Yeah, Giovanna, welcome. Nice to have you on this session. Uh, we were talking about learning things, new things, always be open to learning new things. That's your goal as well. You are, uh, we're going to talk about teacher training as a challenge for the future. Let's start. What, what, what is teacher education exactly? Okay, yes, uh, we can say that teacher's training is a strategic issue at the global level. Uh, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, we, we need to invest in new teachers' generations and develop the skills necessary to encourage, to promote sustainability, well-being, inclusion, and social cohesion. Teachers have a key role in achieving the common results that Francesco referred to before, uh, in the change of mentality necessary to establish a new balance, a new pact with our environment. Teachers have a role for a new sustainable mindset, we can say, to deal with the, our futures. 
due to its history, um, school is an institution which, on one hand, guarantees the transmission of all the knowledge that has settled in the disciplines, but on the other hand, must also ensure the necessary skills for the futures. Schools, therefore, also act as a bridge between identities and cultural roots consolidated over time and identities to be built for the citizens of tomorrow, the European citizens of tomorrow. And the university has not only the goal of training technically expert professionals in the various disciplines that we taught, be taught in the school, but university um, has a, a very big responsibility in training professionals capable of having a vision of the futures and aware of contributing to building these futures thanks to their role as teachers. Uh, teachers uh, are, in literature, we, we found always that teachers are the single most important learning resource available to most students. The teacher's role in this sense is essential in creating a high quality student experiences and enabling the acquisition of knowledge, skills, competencies. Uh, actually, the diversifying students' population and a stronger focus on learning outcomes requires student-centered learning and teaching, and the role of teachers is therefore also changing. This perspective, uh, I, I think, urges European universities to discuss a new professional profile of the teachers of tomorrow, and the contribution that universities can make to their training. The contribution uh, in our European Alliance uh, must come from research because only research can give indication and uh, for identifying trajectories and defining scenarios. Alliances between universities, uh, I think that can certainly offer a valuable contribution in this direction. Yeah, and, and am I right that this is the, the part that is the new approach because teacher education, it has been important for years and years and years. But uh, when you mention the collaboration, the alliance, that's the new part about it, isn't it? Yes, it, the, the, the collaboration inside the alliance uh, can uh, um, give a, a very big contribution for uh, define, as I said, a new profile. Well. EUNIWELL uh, addresses uh, these issues through a specific research arenas, as you said at the beginning of our chat. EUNIWELL deals with uh, well-being across four uh, interdisciplinary research arenas, and the fourth is properly teacher's education arena. As all the other arenas, teacher's education arena will therefore create cross-campus platforms, bringing together academics, policymakers, school networks, and students, of course, to um, radically renew research, education, and transfer nexus, and boost cutting-edge and inter- and transdisciplinary research collaboration. Um, we can say that Uniwell aims to position itself as a leader in the teacher's education in, in Europe. And the aims are a transversal curriculum and an international certificate for European teachers with integrated professional training placements across our regional school network because each university of the Alliance uh, collaborates with uh, school networks at local level. And um, in this framework, uh, um, to foster European student teachers and teachers' identity, some con concrete actions um, are to define a common framework 
of learning outcomes for European teachers' education, to define a transversal curriculum for European teachers, for example, to design and deliver also training for faculty involved in the European curriculum. In this sense, in fact, um, I think that Teachers' Education Arena is representing also an interesting opportunity uh, for faculty development. Um, because uh, uh, as trainers of teachers, uh, university staff is required to reflect on methodologies, innovative strategies for teaching, innovative uh, strategies for um, assessing. And uh, this is a very, a very important, um, a very important issues inside our network. And um, I, I think that it could, it could be important also because uh, um, teachers, uh, uh, academic faculty, uh, is uh, uh, one of the subjects uh, emerging from the literature that affects uh, success and failure of cross-border curriculum partnership and capacity of university staff is perceived could be perceived as a barrier to transnational collaborative partnership. In this sense, faculty development appears to be a strategic action also in terms of overcoming the problems uh, encountered in the European alliances already active in higher education. In this sense, uh, um, Teachers' Education Arena can give a uh, contribution, of course, in teachers' education, and um, also in the improving uh, our uh, teaching methodologies in uh, higher education. So hopefully in the end we have professional standards, we have a, a common language uh, when it comes to teachers being aware of well-being. Uh, thank you so much for this update. Um, but to, to end this, this conversation, what are you looking forward to? What can we expect in the next month? Well, um, yes, professional standards are in fact our first de deliverable. Um, and uh, in the first year, um, the work was dedicated to create a shared program. And uh, the group started uh, um, with an analysis of the situation of teachers' training in the various universities, also in relation to the different national regulations. And the pictures that resulted from this first examination takes into account the differences among the partners and also the wealth of experiences of the institution. Um, and in, we decided to focus on second, secondary school teachers training uh, because we saw that school teachers uh, in uh, primary and infant school um, is uh, quite stable and consolidated. Uh, instead, emerged clearly that the situation is very different for the training of secondary school teachers. Uh, furthermore, secondary school teachers training has a strong implication for different scientific areas uh, based on the plurality of disciplines taught in, in the school. So uh, for, the, for the future and for the next months, um, we, we think to organ, about the organization of seminars open also to other colleagues who are engaged in teaching the teaching of disciplines and that have students who in the future will want to become teachers. And the goal is to strengthen internal reflection at the universities on the challenge of training teachers for the future. And actually, we are working on our first joint product, uh, which will take form uh, uh, of a publication uh, that uh, will allow us to deepen international debate on teachers' training for the future 
competence areas to be trained, developed in higher education programs, and the state of art on initial and continuing training system and, and so on. We want to present uh, the results of our work uh, in international conferences to make know the research that uh, uh, Uniwell is developing uh, uh, within our network about teachers' education and uh, teachers' training. I'm really and, looking uh, forward to it. Well, uh, thank you so much, Giovanna del Gobo from the University of Florence, Chair of the Steering Group teacher education. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's uh, the end of this session. It's uh, time to end the show. But before we say goodbye to you, to all the viewers, I would like to invite my guests to raise glasses with me. It's time to celebrate the first anniversary of Unowell and uh, why not do that with a toast. Uh, please come to the stage if you're in person here in Leiden and uh, hopefully the people on Zoom from Florence will raise the glasses as well. Oh, that looks very well, Francesco. So I have a bottle of champagne and I would like to invite the people come on stage, please. How do I do this? Is, is there a professor good at uh, opening bottle bottles of yeah. champagne? <laughs> so please, and the, the people in Florence, they have the drinks already. Yeah, that looks great. Giovanna, you're only drinking water. No, no. Ah, I was afraid. <laughs> I'm drinking Prosecco. Of course you are. Yeah. Oh, not in my face, please. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, there we go, there we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, Joachim, uh, I give you the first one. Okay. There you are. Maybe yeah. you can say, what are we toasting to? Uh, Uniwell. Well, I think to, exactly, Uniwell to your well-being, to the successful first year. Uh, lots of new ideas and hopefully, yeah, lots of great um, meetings to come and that we... Uh, and well, to meet face to face again soon. Exactly. To, and to everyone's well-being, well, I guess. To everyone's well-being. Cheers. 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 There you go. Cheers. And uh, to the Cheers. people at home, I'd say uh, thank you all for watching. I hope to see you in person, of course. Um, and the next session taking place after the screen break, it's an active screen break, it will be uh, Dimensions of Sustainability. How can we work together to ensure that current and future generations can live together with well-being? It's organized by the University of Cologne. Well, I wish you all a very nice and inspiring day. Thank you all for watching and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank goodbye. you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye, all.